Hello, everybody. We are live. So welcome to the third episode of the coup d'etat of boxing. I'm your co-host, Official Scorecard. And uh, tonight I would be alone because corruption is in boxing. Sorry, corruption in boxing is not available due to, to sickness. So hopefully everything is all right with him and he'll be back the next Sunday. Uh, hello, Shepard. Shep, thank you for joining me in. Yeah, so this episode is probably going to be much shorter than the previous two episodes. However, there are a bunch of fights I'm going to cover. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about what happened. The last night there was two cards. Showtime's card and then Top Rank's card. Hello, Triple JJJ. Thank you for being here. Hope you're doing all right. Thank you for tuning in, guys, again. Anyways. Yeah, like I said, on Showtime's card from the last night, Erickson Lubin fought Terrell Gaucher, if I'm not butchering his name. Then there was Nayambar versus Kobaya Bridi, Bridi and uh, highly talented Jaron Ennis, who faced uh, Juan Carlos Abreu. Then there was Top Rank's card, headlined by Jose Pedraza against uh, Javier Molina. Uh, I cut just two fights from that card. And afterwards, I'm going to proceed talking about uh, the upcoming fights, the fights that are taking place next week. Uh, of course, I'm talking about uh, Mary's Bridis versus Uniel Dorticus as well as the Charlo double-headed, double-header, sorry. Hello, 18s. So yeah, in that Charlo double-header, Jermal Charlo is going to face Sergei Dervianchenko, while his brother Jermal Charlo is facing Jason Rosario, who upset uh, J. Rock Williams in the previous fight and uh, took his belt. Okay, so some of those fights were pretty boring. The last night they were boring. Some fights were not bad, but most of them were boring, to be honest with you. And uh, while most of you were able to enjoy the UFC card, I was watching the PBC card, so you, so you do not have to do it. The main event, Erickson Lubin versus Gaucher, was, in my opinion, such a boring and uneventful fight. If, if just like me, if you, you were watching that on Showtime, I caught some uh, Showtime stream, and in between, in between the rounds, uh, instead of being able to, to see the corners talking to their fighters, they're showing uh, the ads, and before every round, there was an announcement saying that the program may the program may contain the scenes of violence. Well, they should have completely excluded that announcement from the main event, which was pretty much boring and uneventful. Uh, it was a real self-imposed torture to watch that main event. And everything was super boring up till the end of the eighth round, where uh, the fight started being just slightly more interesting. And then in the ninth round, there was more action. Yeah. In the ninth or the tenth round, Gaucher, who was clearly being outboxed by Lubin, but not by much because 
neither of them was doing something something meaningful in the ring. But by the ninth or the tenth round, he hurt Lubin bad. But and then proceeded to have how do how do I say it? Anyways, in that last third, uh, in in the last fourth quarter of the fight, he was he was being a live body, <laughs> unlike for the first eight or ninth round. Hello, B Space. Thank you for joining in again with us. So, if anyone missed it. I said it in the beginning, corruption in boxing is unable to join us tonight because he's not feeling good, he's ill, but I hope he'll he'll be all right for uh, for the next week. <laughs> Triple JJJ joking with me about the main event saying it was a burn burner. Sorry for that. Yeah, I have some trouble with my connection. Anyways, what I was saying is, before talking about uh, Nyambar's fight, I'm just going to say a couple of words about Jerome Boot Ennis's fight against uh, Juan Carlos Abreu. Abreu, who's... Uh, who proved to be a tough customer in the past was defeated and stopped, if I'm not wrong, in in the middle rounds. I mean, in the in the early second half of the fight, sixth or seventh round, if if I'm not wrong. Now Abreu, who who showed to be a live body in his fight against uh, what's the Russian's name? The Russian, uh, his name starts with P. Oh, I, I completely forgot his name. Let me check it. But the Russian, who's uh, a 140 47 pounder who's training in Lomachenko's camp, in that fight. He was clearly outboxed by Russian, but the thing is, and that that fight, keep in mind, it happened a year or two ago. In that fight, he was trying things. He was being a live body, but in this fight, he he was shelling up the whole time, not trying to do anything serious. I mean, just plodding. I think that uh, Jerome Boots Ennis gave a very <laughs> yeah saying Brit. Uh, by the way, welcome, SAS or A S A S and Saint Brit Sports. Welcome, <laughs> yeah, best Putin, best Putin. Thank you, Saint Brit. He was looking <laughs> much better against best Putin. He was trying to to land punches. He was attacking so unlike his last night performance where he just kept a high guard and in the beginning due to Ennis's work rate he was not even able to to plot forward couple of rounds in he started plodding forward towards Boots Ennis but however 
he really had too much trouble with his work rate. And to Ennis's credit, um, knowing what what we know about that type of fighters, let me use the, the S word, sleek fighters, like many people like to call them, and especially those coming from Philly, trying to to be sleek in the ring, etc. And his boots, he has a, he has a very nice work rate, I think so. Now the thing is, in some ways, I like to compare Ennis to to the one uh, fifty four pounder whose name escapes me, Madrimov. Yeah, Israel Madrimov from Uzbekistan. In a way that both of them are uh, flashy fighters, but Comparing them, you know, if I take my eye test into consideration and I compare both of them, I'd say Ennis has he has some things to a lot of things to improve, and both of them have uh, are giving too much openings to their opponents. Now, but uh, but Ennis. I like his work rate. I like that he's uh, he has a pretty much high output, and he's working in the ring. He's not he's not just trying to be defensive. He's not uh, he's not uh, a guy a gun shy boxer. And that's one thing I like about him. Now the problem with him is that he's extremely open for the counters, especially when uh, when he goes in with three, four, five punch combos. Now, up till now, he did not really have an opponent who, who would be able to exploit those mistakes. But in my opinion, he really needs to correct and improve that. Similar, similar to Madrimov, but just like I was saying about Medrimov in the previous episode, that I was hoping that it was just the case of Medrimov not taking his opponent seriously. I hope this is the case with uh, Jerome Boots Ennis as well. I mean, he's a uh, he's pretty entertaining fighter, and uh, of course, I like flash fighters because they're interesting and... Uh, and they could especially be interesting to, to, to the casuals. So there is a lot of potential of becoming a big star in the future. But I just think that he really needs to work on those things because he was very open for counters. And what Abril was doing in the, in the later rounds he was uh, he landed a couple of looping right hands upstairs and also he was landing a lot of straight straight rights to the body which were really telegraphed i had the impression that he he started telegraphing them in his changing room you know so it was very easy to see those uh, those right hands and i think that he was trying the right things, but he was just so gun shy, so defensive, not not opening up. That at, at moments I thought that I was watching uh, Jeron Ennis in a heavy bag. Now the thing about Ennis is, um, look, you you do not have. You don't even have to be uh, technically perfect in order uh, for people to to start believing that that you have a bright future in front of you, especially if you're working hard and if Jeron Ennis is uh, working hard, is dedicated in the ring, has the right team of coaches around him, good sparring partners, and being that he's, I think, only 23 years old, 
if he stays on the right track, I do believe he can really, really become a big name in boxing in the future. But with that said, I would really like to see him correct most of those things. Uh, by the way, hold on. Before going to the number fight, big up to Big Dan. God bows to me, Justin Marshall. Box, box, big up to box as well. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Chaka Picard. Um, yeah. But about the number fight, so he, he fought Kobaya Bridi the guy who I was watching for the first time and who took, uh, who took this fight on a five weeks notice, if I'm not wrong. And it was such a good fight, in my opinion. Now, I'm going to take you through that fight. But just before that, be up to that guy as well. And uh, I think people in the chat room are talking about the possible Virgil Ortiz versus uh, Jaron Ennis fight. Look, if it happens at this very moment, at this point, I would certainly favor Virgil Ortiz. I think really highly of him. And uh, But anyways, let, let's see them in, in a couple of years. Who knows how, how much Jerome Ennis would be able to improve and uh, in, in the future, in the, in the next couple of years, it may become a very, very good fight between two young, talented guys. The Troll Network, hello, hello, my man. No homo. Uh, yeah, but from this whole PBC card that played out last night, I really enjoyed the number fight. Now, like I told you, that guy, Kobaya Breedy, I saw him for the first time, and uh, visually, he is very resemblant to <laughs> even his name, to Bradley, <laughs> even a shaven head, <laughs> bald guy, uh, wearing... Wearing the, the same type, uh, the same type of trunk. But anyways, what I got from this fight is that uh, Nyambar, he's a very lazy fighter. And, uh, and the way he was fighting, I was thinking, like, man, why are you doing this? Because you're... I don't know how to how to put it together. He seems like he seems really lazy in the ring. Given the first round, I saw that he's technically superior and has uh, a bigger punching power than Breedy. And he started fight very well. He's accurate. His punches are very accurate. And I'll go to the, to it later. But despite that, even in the first round, he was getting outlanded out and outworked by Breedy. Uh, Breedy, who in the beginning, the first two rounds, he was jumping in, trying to, to throw three, four, five punch combos. And really quickly, he found out that he shouldn't be doing it against Nyambar who, like I told you, is very accurate. And I was amazed that he's not only accurate with his single punches, but he's really able to throw four or five piece combos with, with uh, great precision. And I was really, really impressed with that. And he has really nice timing, and he was catching Breedy early in the rounds, in the early rounds, clean, on the jaw, his face, body punches, really good. And so at the very end of the first round, he dropped Breedy, then 
second round, Brady uh, start, uh, continued on doing the same thing. And he got dropped again. This time, I think it was at the beginning of the second round. And then after that, Brady recognized that he was staying too long in the pocket against Nyambar, who was very precise and he who was not only countering him with single punches, but like I told you, with three, four, five piece combos, and all of those punches were accurate. Uh, he was catching him with with all combos he threw when uh, when Brady was in the pocket against him. Now, on the other hand, Namba showed me that his defense is not that good. He He's getting easily caught with punches, especially since the third round on when... Um, What's his name? Kobaya Brady, when he started circling around, staying at long range, using all the ring, ring estate available to him, moving all around the ring. And uh, what he was lo looking to do it was to get, to get an angle and then jump in with single shots or uh, two-piece combos, short combos. And for a very long time, I mean, I would even say up till the very end of the fight, he was uh, he was catching Nyambar with straight rights and overhand rights all the time, single overhand rights, jumping in from long range and then immediately getting out of packet. Uh, and uh, I was amazed that, ne in, in a negative sense, that Nyambar was not able to correct this for uh, for uh, during the whole fight you know uh and uh, in general he's he's getting hit easily from the long range when uh, Brady was stepping in from from long range with uh, either single punches or just short combos and then moving out uh yeah so that was a a bad thing hold on in the chat room the shepherd of sons saying King Tag was an elite amateur even at a young age. Yeah, and uh, you know, I I want to say a couple a couple more things about him, uh, Shep. I think that uh, it's been such a long time before, since I saw a fighter who, whose combos are so fluent He's extremely fluent with his combos. He's very creative with his with his combos. Um, I also think that uh, the commentators were, were right that he was not using his jab enough, not nearly enough. But every time he he used his jab, he was making the difference, and he was he was preventing he was preventing Brady from uh, jumping in and landing his punches on Ambar, but also with, with his jab he was scoring and setting the other punches, the power punches, and he has pretty good jab, and uh, yeah, he, he used it upstairs to the body, but not nearly enough, and I wonder why, because every time he used it, he had a much, a much better time, and yeah, and his body shots, I, I, I do think that his his uppercuts are also great. He was landing a lot of extremely nice uppercuts to the body, both right and left uppercut. And speaking about his uppercuts and his combos, I was impressed with his... Uh, there was a combo that, that he used a couple of times in the mid... Uh, in the in the mid rounds and uh, in the second half of the fight, and it was to throw one two, then feint another straight right with his right shoulder, and then after that follow it up with the left left uppercut upstairs. So he would throw one two, feint another two with his right shoulder, and then throw a left uppercut, or he would throw um, straight right stra straight left then. Paint, uh, paint the right hand again, and come up, come up with the left uppercut upstairs again. It was, I mean, it was adorable to see to see his combos, but 
unfortunately for him, he was not really letting his hands go. So it made me think, was it maybe he has some stamina issues? Uh, I was not sure. I was wondering ab about either his possible stamina issues, either about his chin. Maybe he doesn't want to get hit. Maybe he knows something we do not know, or I don't know at least, because unfortunately I was not following him in, in the amateurs and uh, I, to be honest with you I was never really following the amateur fights to begin with like most of you know but I was really impressed every time he let his hands go but he was uh, he was uh, picking too much the, the, the spots when he's going to fight and that's why look if If uh, there was a bigger sense of urgency from him, I don't doubt he would be able to easily easily win most of the rounds, if not all the rounds, against Breedy. Breedy, who, you know, <laughs> another way he, he reminds me of Bradley is that he, he's a workhorse, he works hard. You see that his skills are not that wonderful, at least not at the level of Nyanbar, not at all. But with his sheer activity and volume, he was able to, to outland, uh, outland Nyanbar in some of those rounds. Now the decision, of course, I'm surprised that one of the judges had it 115, 111 for, uh, for Breedy. I, I, I really thought that Breedy won a couple of rounds and I was not sure because, look, when I was watching that fight, I was more, more paying attention to, to both of the fighters, to their skills, to what they're doing, how they're fighting instead of just simply scoring fights. Uh, if it was the case, I would be able to, to give you my precise score but I was not really paying attention to that. That was not uh, my, you, you know, I was not really concentrating on that. I was, I was much more analyzing both of the fighters in the ring, their skills, what they're doing, etc. So yeah, I was, I was con confused with the scorecards, but at the same time, I was suspicion. Uh, I had this suspicion that he may get trapped just because of his low work rate and uh, being that when both of them were, were throwing punches in the packet, uh, <laughs> you have these oldest judges scoring the fights and they're not even seeing what's really happening. They're not paying attention whose punches are landing and whose punches are not landing. And there was uh, there were many occasions where uh, Brady will, would get get clipped in the exchange, but continue fighting, especially uh, throwing punches, especially in the later rounds. Uh, so yeah, the, the later rounds were very good. Now most 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 of the middle rounds, it was Breedy circling, moving a lot, and uh, jumping in with single or two piece combos, single punches or two piece combos, you know. So, and Nyambar, on the other hand, was not uh, feeling a, sen a sense of emergency to. Uh, to pressure him, he had problems cutting off the ring, I think. Uh, sorry, I got the call. Sorry for uh, for that. Anyways, who else is in, in the chat? Charlie <laughs> Gotenov. <laughs> Big up, yeah. Charlie Zelenov. Intangible boxing news. Thank you for being here. John Gonzalez. Big up. And like I, I was always saying, it's always better to have John on your side than against you. Because we, we know very well what he's doing with his victims. So we are so glad that John sees us as his friends. Yeah, for oh, jo Johnny Boy, 
Johnny Boy, big up. Yeah, so salute to Johnny Boy Fight Palace. Most of you know him, but if you don't know him, visit his channel and subscribe. Uh, anyways, where was I? Yeah, so Lambert was, was having trouble was having trouble cutting off the ring and he was being really lazy but if he put more effort he would be a clear winner even on the judges scorecards but anyways that's it about this pbc card by the way for any of you tuning in just now i'm alone on this show because uh, corruption was not able to participate due to illness so I just spoke about the PBC card. Um, I was able to see early in the morning, I was able to catch the replay of uh, Robisi Ramirez's fight against Felix Carabayo. And um, in between the fights on PBC, I caught the last three or four rounds of FA Jagba versus Jonathan Rice. Now, when I tuned in, it was around the seventh round of, of the Ajagba fight. <laughs> and Bradley was talking about Ajagba possibly getting a title shot. I mean, it, it was not really like uh, he was pushing for it. And anyways, no one should be pushing for Ajagba getting a title shot soon with the performance that he gave us the last night, at least from what I was able to see in the in the last three or four rounds I caught. But another thing I want to criticize uh, Tim Bradley for is that him labeling Ajagba, F.A. Ajagba as athletic. I mean, hold on. I'll show you how athletic was he from what I was able to see the last night. Hold on, let me share share the screen. Uh, share screen. Yeah, but anyways, he was getting caught. Uh, just give me a second, I'm sharing the screen. Uh, okay, so here we are. Yeah, I hope you're able to see this. Yeah, so Tim Bradley saying F. A. Jagba is athletic. This is what I was seeing. And Nefin 3. He was as athletic as the tree, tree trunk. Yeah, so that's all. But anyways, he was getting caught with right hands, not, not judging the distance well, and he was super stiff. Mm, so I, I don't even want to... <sighs> To spend too much time talking about what I saw in that fight. Uh, unfortunately for me, Jose Pedraza, the main event of that card, of Top Rank's card, from what I was able to, to read earlier on Twitter, people are saying he had a very nice performance. Unfortunately, I was not able to catch it. But after that card, I went to YouTube and watched uh, Ramirez's fight against Felix Car Ca sorry, Carabayo. Okay, Rubisi Ramirez, two-time gold Olympic medalist. Um, so he's been fighting for one year and one month as a pro. So just a bit more than one year of his pro career and he already has six fights against him uh, behind him i think so let me check it out but i think it's the case rubisi ramirez yeah so it, it was his sixth pro fight so he was I mean, from, from what I remember watching the last Olympics with him, 
during the, the last Olympics, I was telling myself, if he ever becomes a pro, I think he's going to to translate very well and rather easily to the pro game because of the way he was fighting, at least from what I believe. And uh, you guys know that I'm not really following. I was not following the amateurs too much up till now, but at least from what I remember, in the amateur, in the Olympic tournament, he has a rather high work rate. Uh, he was uh, boxing at mid-range, exchanging punches, countering. But from what I remember, he had a very high output. Now, I get it. He's still young. He's, le he's learning the, the pro game and he's 26 years old. And when it comes to mid-range exchanges, he was he was doing really well. He is a very accurate, similar to Nyambar. He was very accurate with his combos, counter punches. He he showed some really good counter punching in the last night fights against Carabayo. And uh, yeah, he was managing the distance very well. But what I was looking to see in that fight was fighting at short range. And now, whenever Carabayo was was closing the distance on him and uh, was able to come to, to short range right in front of Ramirez, Ramirez was never fighting it at, at a very short range. What he was doing was he was uh, he was having his guard high and just trying to to pivot out out of that situation. For example, when Carabayo had him on the ropes, shoulder to shoulder, or rather, let's say, uh, guard to guard. He kept that high guard and just try, try, he was trying to maneuver his opponent. And he, he had success doing so. But he was not really fighting on the inside now. Maybe he's going to do it. Maybe he'll... I would say he'll have to, to learn to do it. I mean, I, I get it for a fighter who's much be better at mid-range or long-range controlling the distance with his footwork. Uh, I do think that a Shepherd of Suns saying Ramirez beat Kodo last, last night. <laughs> no, so, so of course, when, when you're fighting your opponent, of course, you're, you're going to, if you're able, you're going to, to pick the range you prefer to fight at. But there are going to be the times in the future, especially when, when he moves up. I mean, not move up, not to move up in weight, but in competition where uh, he will be forced to, you know, to do something. And let's let's put it just this way. He was doing well not getting hit on the inside. On the other hand, he was not trying anything at all to land on the inside. And that's the thing. I mean, I'm sure still work in progress. So, but other than that, he's, he's counter-punching his combos. Exchanges with his opponent, all of that was looking very good. So, okay, let's go on to another opponent and let's see what, what he's going to do. Uh, Shep, Shepherd of Sons, saying Ramirez needs to move down in weight. Yeah, I mean, look, Shep, anyways, Shep is a guy, one of the guys to go to when you want to talk about the amateurs. Too bad he's not he's not really really participating on the podcasts. It's it's a shame because the same way like just like our friend Duck he he watches a lot of fights, pros or amateurs. Okay, hold on, let me take a sip of coffee. 
trust me, it's not that easy at all to, to be alone and speak non-stop. <laughs> <laughs> John Gonzalez is earlier saying about F.A. Jagba as athletic as my deceased victims. <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Big up, John, again. Okay, so what else? What else is there? Oh, sorry guys, yeah, like I told you, I need a lot of fluids, drinks, because I'm alone. Anyways, okay, so 40 minutes in, and uh, I was able to cover all the fights I saw the last night. So, what's next? Yeah. By 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 my own planning, I'm going to talk about the future fights that are taking place the, the next week. So yeah, because we are not going... I mean, this is the last show be, before that finals, cruiserweight finals be, uh, between uh, Bridis and Unil Dorticos take place. And it's taking place the same day, or rather, the same night. The Charles doubleheader is taking place. So I'm going to talk about three of those fights. Now, Meyer is British versus Dorticos. It's taking place in Germany. Uh, before uh, this virus thing, it was scheduled to happen... In Mary's British's backyard in Latvia, but they switched to, to Germany to, to Munich. And I'm even I'm even thinking if I should go to Germany. I, I mean I'm 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 not aware, I'm not even aware if if we from France, if we can travel to Germany right now, I think so. Probably I'm almost positive about that. So I was considering going to to watch it live, but I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe I go there. Anyways, yeah. Any of you already following uh, my own channel, you know that uh, when this fight was already supposed to happen around, uh, well, almost a year ago, I think, or less. I already did a fight preview, breakdown and prediction. And to be honest with you, my opinion hasn't changed a lot since that. The only difference is um, the home turf advantage that I was talking about in my video. The home turf advantage that Bridis was supposed to have if that fight was taking place in Latvia, but as it's not the case anymore, the those things are not the same, of course. But anyways, me personally, I'm favoring, I'm slightly favoring Bridis. And I mean, look, Yunil Dorticos, if he's able to catch... Um, to catch Bridis with his, uh, and he's a classic one, two, three type of fighter, puncher, uh, Unil Dorticos I'm talking about. I'm sure he, he would be able to hurt Bridis and to hurt him bad. But, and he, he, he showed uh, a lot of stamina and uh, a, a, huge, a big work rate in his previous fight in, in half in semifinals against uh, Andrew the Beast Tabidi. Yeah. But the thing the difference between Andrew the Beast Tabidi and Mary's Bridis is that Tabidi was fighting at one range. He was staying outside of Bridis's range sorry not Bridis's Dorticus's range, I mean. He was circling around the ring, 
and staying at outside all the time. So it was it was much easier for uh, for Dorticos, who who by the way was cutting cutting off the ring pretty well against him to close to close the distance and catch him on the ropes because uh, Tabiri was doing half of half of uh, Dorticos's job for him. He was circling all, all around the rings, close to the ropes, and uh, was predictable. Yeah, he, he had the foot speed, but his footwork is not that, not that educated. I do think that Tabiri is another... And I, I, I do think that uh, Tabiri maybe is not... Maybe is not isn't an American, maybe he's, maybe I'm wrong, but maybe he's coming from, from an African country, I'm not sure, but anyways, the way he fought that fight, it was telling me that he was suffering from the same problems the American, uh, most of the American so-called current so-called slick fighters are, are suffering, meaning that they're just using their athleticism, moving a lot around the ring without uh, actually doing the right things while lacking, lacking, lacking some skills and not being too compact, but basing their, um, their performances on their, on their athletic abilities, on their speed, foot speed, hand speed, and just moving around. Uh, Saint Brit Sport saying, I don't know who to pick in that fight and Jermal Dervianchenko. Well, well, look, right now I'm talking about all those fights, so hopefully I've, I would be able to, to help you, maybe not, let's see. But anyways, yeah, <clears throat> but he was staying at one same range until uh, Dorticos was able to, to close the distance and land punches on him, tra uh, trap him on the ropes and land, land his combos. But Dorticos, anyways, he's someone who prefers to throw punches at long or uh, at long range or long mid range. And I do think that his punches are kind of predictable. But of course, if he if he hits you, he hits like a truck, and uh, of course, Bridis would be in trouble. But the thing with with Bridis, look, in my prediction and breakdown video for that fight from a couple of months ago, I was comparing him to Andre Ward, and there's a lot of similarities in between them. A very high ring IQ. Both of them are dirty fighters. Um, not shying away from <laughs> uh, using the different plethora of illegal tactics. I mean, and their footwork is very good, and they they can fight at all ranges, and they can uh, they can switch the ranges and confuse their opponents by that, and. I think this should be the difference. It would be something that, that is going to, to make the difference in the Dorticos fight in uh, Bridis's favor. So, look, and I'm saying all of that uh, understanding or at least expecting to see the best possible version of Bridis in the ring. Now, if he's lazy, he's going to, to have problems because Dorticus's work rate is very good. And uh, he's, a, he's a non stop pressure fighter, but uh, throws his punches from, uh, he doesn't throw his punches from short range, but he's non stop pressuring fighters, his opponents, and uh, he, has a, he, has a, he has a rather high work rate. But the thing with Bridis is he can move laterally very well. He can go, he can switch the, the, the ranges from mid to short range, from long, long to mid range. 
and this way I think that he's going to to confuse uh, to confuse um, uh, Dorticus. On top of that, no matter how good uh, Dorticus is at cutting of the ring, he still does need to set his feet in order to punch. And I do think that uh, Bridis is going to keep him off balance. And uh, also, Gassiev in the last year's semifinals, or was it rather two years ago, a year or two ago, when um, Dortikos lost to, to Gassiev, Gassiev was not moving around too much, but he would throw, he would throw a punch left right and then on the on, on that second on that second punch on the right hand he would step to to an outside angle he would uh, place his uh, rear foot his right foot on the outside of Dorticus lead left foot and from there he would come in with with a hook or the uppercut and that way he was really able to to confuse to confuse Dorticos and make him miss and get counter at the same time. Bridis, I think he he's going to spend some time uh, you know pushing around, uh, clinching with Dorticos, confusing him. He's definitely going to be dirty now. Dorticus, on the other hand, can get can get dirty as well. Anytime he he misses or goes with his hook or overhand right over his opponent's head, he leaves it on their necks and then pulls their neck down for a um, for a punch with the other hand. You know, so <laughs> I would not be I would not be surprised if. If, if we see some points taken away, but at the same time, you know that judges are pretty much tolerable. They, they tolerate dirty tactics a lot. Big up to L-Dog. Thank you for being here as well. Thank you. Thank you for following the show. If you're tuning in just now, Corruption is not able to be here tonight. I'm alone. I just covered uh, the PBC card from the last night, a couple of fights from Top Ranks card, and now I'm talking about Dorticos versus Bridis and uh, the Charlo Brothers fights. Yeah, so... But anyways, speaking of the Dorticos bridis fight, if Bridis doesn't show in shape, He's going to lose the fight. Uh, I, I really like both of them for different reasons. Although I do think Breed is, is sometimes too dirty and I don't like that. I hate to see that in the fights. But beside him being dirty, a dirty fighter, I think that he's very skilled. He has a very high ring IQ. And uh, look, in many fights, he showed that he can move laterally, um, create create angles. He he can fight at all the ranges. And uh, in the past, he was looking flat in some uh, in some fights that he was not taking seriously. Uh, notably in the quarterfinals. Now. Trust me, I, I may be completely wrong about this, but from what I remember, I thought he probably lost that quarterfinal fight, but I'm not sure. Or maybe I completely for, forgot how, how that fight went. Then he was looking terrible against Master Nack, but again, Master Nack, he's, uh, he's a good long-range fighter, uh, good ones and twos, uh, is he a southpaw or not? I cannot remember, but he's able to to punch on the move, and he was doing that all the time, jumping from the outside, which is so unlike Uniel Dorticos. So, yeah, and there, uh, Mary's Bridis look really flat, really bad. <clears throat> then, in the semifinals against. Um, 
Oh, what the... <laughs> I don't know for what reason I cannot recall many fighters' names tonight, uh, but but you know the, the, the bold Polish guy that, that got defeated, Glowacki, Glowacki, yeah, Glowacki. Uh, so against him, I thought that he was looking sharp in the beginning, that fight did not last long, that semi-final against uh, Glowacki. But I do think he was looking sharp in that fight. And then it was it was a shame the way the way that fight finished. And uh, was it Robert Bird refereeing that fight? He did an all-time terrible, terrible, just terrible job in that fight. And... Uh, I mean, I get it. Glowatsky started first with, uh, with with the illegal blows, from what I remember. But Bridis really overreacted, and it was a shame that what what he was doing doing against Glowatsky, to be honest with you. But despite that, credit to him for uh, for uh, for all the knowledge, all the skills he's showing in the ring. And so I think that Bridis, he's a, he's a case of someone fighting up to his opponent's level. And for all the big fights, he was, he was really well prepared. Uh, I mean, uh, <clears throat> the previous semifinals against uh, Usyk, which he lost, but he gave Usyk a really tough fight. He was... He was he was performing really well despite the defeat against Usyk, and it's not a small thing, you know. It's not like he lost to some uh, to some average cruiserweight. No, it was uh, Usyk who is one of the greatest cruiserweights. But anyways, look, me myself, I'm expecting or hoping to see Bridis in his best possible shape. And if he shows up in a such 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 shape, such a shape, I'm picking him to to win against Dirtikos, who who's another great fighter and uh, a lot of respect to him. But I do think he's uh, beside his work rate and his pressure and power. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, please. I do think that he's predictable. And someone with such a high ring IQ as Maris Bridis is going to be able, if on his best, is going to be able to exploit his uh, his deficiencies. So yeah, I'm not sure how how it may end because definitely both of them have um, have the tools to hurt each other really bad and to to stop each other. But I think that for the most part, Bridges is going to be able to to evade his punches with his footwork, with uh, and with his ring IQ, and land some sneaky punches himself. So I would not be surprised at all if he manages to stop Dorticos. But I'm not sure about that. I'm still wondering if. But one thing is sure. Let's say I'm favoring Bridis, but he may win the decision, but he also may win uh, by stoppage. Notably, our friend Mark from Unrivaled Boxing Talking News. And uh, if you don't know his channel, I urge you to, to visit his channel, subscribe. He predicted, uh, he dropped his prediction video a couple of days ago. And he predicted um, Bridis by a 10th round stoppage, I think. And then our other friend, Minimax, Minimax Boxing, visit and subscribe to his channel as well. Shout out to him. He had a pretty similar um, prediction, picking Bridis in the 11th round, if I'm not wrong. <coughs> Pardon me. Okay, so before going to the two Charles fights, let me just see some comments. Yeah, I already gave shout out to my brother from France, B Space. Bonsoir, bonsoir. 
<laughs> oh shit! I missed your comment. So the thing about Brady's Dorticus fight was for your prediction league. Shep was saying, don't help him. He wants it for the prediction league. <laughs> yeah, again, big up L-Dog. Uh, <laughs> L-Dog has uh, Dorticus by late TKO or KO. Yeah, I mean, I see it, especially like I told you, man. Especially if uh, we don't see Vridis at his best. And keep in mind, he's already 35 years old. So so it's not out of question that we, we may see uh, fl flat, uh, flat uh, Vridis once again. And okay, um, Dorticus... At least on the paper, he's 34 years old, a, a year younger than Bridis, at least on paper. But judging by his last couple of fights, by his work rate, he, he seems fresh. So at least uh, no matter no matter Dorticus's real age, he does not look old in the ring. So yeah, I can see it. Now... I can also see the scenario of him possibly winning um, winning the decision, which I don't, I don't really believe it would happen, but I could see see it, you know, also Dorticos winning the decision just because of his war trade. Uh, hold on. What else are you seeing in the chat? I'll dog with his usual trolling. <laughs> okay, well. Uh, but he also says, I think Bridis is on the slide. He looked bad against Noel Gaver. Yeah, I... see, that's that was the quarterfinals, uh, right, Aldog? See, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure if it was the fight I was watching, but I thought that at least I was watching a couple of the quarterfinals live, and I thought one or two of, of the quarterfinals were robberies so i'm wondering if 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 it was the case with uh, with the british uh, noel fight uh hold on let me go through more comments duck big up good evening bro Ennis versus abru was funny lol that blatant low blow Abru is a dirty mother. <laughs> Good seeing him get KO'd. <laughs> I, hey, hey. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Duck, but you know what? I was happy about that low blow because I am seeing you talk that way about that low blow that uh, that Abru landed on uh, on Ennis. It tells me that you missed what what, what occurred just seconds before that. And uh, it was uh, Boots Anis landing about fourth, third or fourth or fifth low blow on uh, on Abreu. So Abreu uh, retaliated. That's all. And I was happy to see to see it because anytime people are boxers are dirty in the ring. I love when their their opponents are retaliating, you know. And the, yeah, um, that's something that that I forgot to mention about the Lubin fight. Lubin was constantly late uh, landing the southpaw left uh, straight lefts under the belt and to the balls. I mean, many times it looked like uh, he was not doing it intentionally, but I saw many low blows with that left southpaw hand of Lubin, you know. Uh, hold on, let me go through more comments. Uh, Duck saying, that's the thing, Breed is in top shape and injury-free, beats Dorticus, but will he be? Yeah, I mean, unless we were we were some insiders we cannot know it for sure the next best thing is to to watch for 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 the recent 
material on the video if if there's any of it posted uh, posted on the social media in order to figure it out <clears throat> uh, that saying uh, Yevor or Jevor versus Breeds was a robbery yeah so I think I think that was one of the fights I thought was a robbery from what I remember <laughs> <laughs> Funny names in the chat room. Hold on, let me let me light up my cigarette. Duck again saying, Oh yeah, I know it was retaliation official, but Abri fights 13 every fight. I left my ass off. Oh hold on, hold on. Yeah. You know what? The the last fight from him was was, was the one uh, versus B Besputin. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I I think I saw him. You know, doing using a lot of illegal tactics. Yeah. So what it what comes whatever that that however that saying goes. Justin Marshall saying Virgil beats Anis easy i think so too you know justin at least at the moment virgil seems as a much more mature fighter and for me definitely he's uh he's a top level talent not saying that any isn't but uh judging by my own eye test i think that any may become even much better than he's now if he's a serious boxer if you know if he's fighting constantly and he's only 23 years old so so he may improve a lot but i see that skill wise there there is difference and i think that he's very open to counters i mean he his previous fight the, the one he had uh, right before this fight i think so it was against some uh, some small russian guy right before uh, before this virus crisis and the uh, Russian was just too short, you know, and not able to land his counters, but he was seeing the openings for counters, and uh, he's so easy to counter he, when he's throwing punches, especially when, when he goes in with four or five punch combos. He needs to correct that. Oh, uh... Duck again, saying Virgil couldn't put Samuel Vargas down. That was disappointing to me. Even Khan did that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point. But and I thought, I thought I saw in that fight some, uh, you know, some of the mistakes Virgil was doing. I cannot remember what what it really was. But other than that, I still thought that technically he was performing pretty well. But yeah, let me just take a couple of sips of couple of sips of coffee before going to to the Charlotte double header. Now I'm going I'm going to leave uh, Jermal Charlo versus Sergei Dervyanchenko for the last. I'm just going to quickly say a couple of words about uh, Jermel Charlo, the 54-pounder against Jason Rosario, who upset Jarek Williams in the previous fight. Uh, I was not really able to see many, many of Rosario's fights. I watched two of his fights just before this show, and I did it rather, rather quickly because I was thinking about all the topics I'm going to cover tonight with you guys. But anyways, Jason Rosario, he's, he's keeping his hands low, even when he goes with his one-twos. He's... I don't know his his punches, his ones, 
his one twos are not compact at all. He's very open to the counter punches, you know. And even J Rock Williams was able, despite having a much shorter arm length, he was able to to counter him with many jabs and right hands, long right hands. And even or even initiate the action and uh, land one and twos on Jason Rosario. So yeah, not only that uh, Jason Rosario is very open upstairs and he's telegraphing his punches uh, and the way he throws them, they're not compact at all. I don't know how to describe it, but he stays very open for the punches upstairs. And the difference between two Ch Ch Charlo brothers is that the one he's fighting the next week he has much quicker one twos and uh, despite even even the younger Jermel Charlo telegraphing his one two sometimes they're much quicker and much compact much quicker and cap compact than his bigger brother Jermel Charlo and let's not even compare his one twos to to Jason Rosario's one twos so I would expect Jermel Charlo to stop him. I haven't seen too much of uh, Jermel's fights, neither. Before going, you know, before... Um, how do you say it? Before betting on those two fights. And I have the, the intention to bet on both of the Charles fights, despite the odds not being really good at, for, at, at all, in my opinion, but nothing surprising about it. I'm, I'm positive, I'm definitely going to pick uh, German, sorry, Jermel Charlo against Jason Rosario. And uh, so, yeah, I have Jermel Charlo winning. I would expect to see him winning by stoppage. That's all about that fight. Now, is it the main event, Sergey Derianchenko versus Jermel Charlo? Before going there, let me just give a shout out to Vader D. Uh, he's saying, hey, official, just a heads up. In case you didn't know, there is a lot of mechanical background noise coming through. Oh, oh I completely, completely forgot about it. It's, it's my brother's PlayStation. It really annoys me. So I'm really sorry about that, guys. So, <laughs> look. I'm going to mute myself a second and see if he can turn it off. If not, oh, he cannot do it. So, yeah, sorry. Sorry about that. Sorry for the background noise. Really sorry about that. Thank you for letting me know. I even forgot about it. And it really annoys me. But and sorry, sorry, sorry for you guys having to listen to it. But it is what it is for tonight. Really sorry about it. Uh, yeah, Doc was saying uh, Pedraza was looking really good. El Dog agreeing with him. He wants to see him fight the winner of Berenchik versus Zepeda. Uh, Doc saying Pedraza would give Jose Ramirez problems. Uh, El Dog not being really high on Jose Ramirez, Doc neither. Okay. So let's go to, to the last topic. Jermal Charlo versus Sergey Dervianchenko. Now, I'm hoping, I'm hoping to to make a film study video on my either on my own personal channel, yeah, on my personal channel for this fight for the main event because I have uh, I have seen a lot of fights from both of them. I have. I already prepared many clips, so I'll do my best 
to do the film study video and show you what I'm going to just only talk about tonight. So let's start by some facts. I think that Jermel Charlo, he has a very good chin. Now, okay, he was not fighting some, some killers, but I saw him many times taking taking a lot of flash punches on his face and his chin. And he was taking them extremely well. And not only that, but also that, <laughs> trust me, and I'm going to show, show it to you in my film study video on the other channel. Many times I saw him in the exchanges getting clipped right on the chain with, with some good punches and then proceeding to, to throw his punches almost immediately after, after getting clipped. So I do, I do think he has, uh, he possibly has, uh, he, he maybe have even an, an iron chain. So do not be surprised about that. But despite that, can, can Sergei Dervianchenko stop him? So, sorry for that. <clears throat> you know what? Yeah, I can see. I can see the scenario of Dervianchenko stopping him with his work rate and a lot of body punches, a lot of angles. So it, his style would be would definitely be something that uh, Jermal Charlo never n never saw in the ring before Derevchenko. So there's that possibility, mm. but I'm not so sure about that. I don't think on it. I saw some some people picking Sergey. But it's it's really difficult to for me to take really ser uh, this, that scenario really seriously. I mean, yeah, it can happen. And to be honest with you, I prefer the Vianchenko style over Charlo style or even over Golovkin style. But I'm just trying to come up with the right prediction. I'm in the quote unquote business of giving you the right predictions. At least that's my point on YouTube, either on this channel or on, or on my own personal channel. I'm trying to give you the right predictions, not, not just to blindly root for, uh, for fighters. So yeah, I mean, with his work rate, and he definitely may land a lot of body punches, especially since the way I really closely analyzed his fight against Triple G and the way he, he was able to land a lot of punches against Triple G was when Triple G was trying to throw Steve jabs. He was ducking, slipping, slipping underneath his jab and using the fact that Golovkin was throwing hard, uh, trying to throw a hard jab, Steve jab, it takes more time to throw a such a jab than just a short, quick, light, quick jab, you know. So he was able not only slip underneath it, but right after slipping, he was putting his right glove over Golovkin's jabbing hand after Golovkin missed with uh, with the jab, and he was um, he was disabling Golovkin. Okay, so there's no more noise in the background. That's a good thing. Yeah, so after slipping Golovkin's jab and getting on the inside, he would immediately put his gloves on uh, Golovkin's left upper arm, preventing him from, uh, from, from getting that left arm in a high guard position. That way he was able to manipulate it to uh, prevent him from uh, keeping his uh, left arm and left glove up 
and uh, he would usually start with with combos to the body then go upstairs and the reason why uh, after the body punches he was also able to to land uh, the punches upstairs against Golovkin was because he was keeping that the right right glove over Golovkin's left upper arm preventing him to 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 keep it up after missing with his jab. So that way I can see, you know, I can see the Ryonchenko getting even having having an an even easier time getting on the inside against Charlo because Charlo, unlike Galatkin's jab, he he's not really he has a quicker jab, a uh, more explosive jab, but he's not really able to use it in different ways, in n- at least not not as many different ways as Triple G is able to able to use it. <clears throat> Pardon me again. Yeah. So and by the way, Golovkin and, and I talked about uh, making a separate video showing you the skills of Golovkin, how he was able to to change the way uh, he was throwing that left hand throughout that fight against uh, the Ryonchenko, despite being out of his prime. Uh, when he figured out what the Ryonchenko was doing, he started uh, he starting hooking off his jab, you know, because and and that's something that Charlo, the Jermal Charlo, may. And should really, I would encourage him to do against the Ryanchenko, hooking off the jab, not just throwing single jabs, and especially not that <clears throat> stiff power jab. He should rather look to to make it to make it quick as possible, because after getting countered to the body many times by by the Ryanchenko, what Galakin was doing. From that point on, the only time he stepped in with a stiff jab against the Ryonchenko was when uh, the Ryonchenko was on the outside and out of balance, uh, bouncing, you know, not not having a solid connection between the canvas and his feet. That was the only way from that point on that uh, Galavkin was throwing stiff jabs. And uh, Galavkin... He also used his uppercut really well, and um, he started using jab, left hook, right uppercut, and it was landing. And this this is something I would encourage uh, Charlo to do. And uh, moreover, he has really good uppercut, deadly uppercut on the inside. So, yeah, I definitely can see Charlo hurting the Ryonchenko. And another point that no one was mentioning about the Ryonchenko is that he tends to get to get tired in the in the late rounds from from the fights I saw from him. Uh, now, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I think it was the case. In the last two rounds against uh, Jacobs, maybe not, maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong about that fight, but I'm hundred percent sure about his fight against Golovkin. Golovkin completely took it over in the last two rounds. So, yeah, um, uh, Derevchenko, his activity, his punching output is really high, and he's very energetic in the ring, fighting all the time. Uh, throws a lot of punches, moves a lot, uh, uses a lot of upper body movement, but I would not be surprised if in this fight as well, by, by the 10th round, he his stamina gets depleted because of his activity, you know. Now, can I see Charlo stopping him? I can see I can see it definitely, but I'm not I'm not so sure about it neither. I mean he can set up punches and look the bad thing is that I cannot remember all the things I saw in uh, while studying their uh, their their fights in this cup 
in the in this couple of previous days but i'm definitely not going to miss anything in my film study on the on the other channel because i saw so many things so many things that charlo is doing that he can do that can really hurt Dervianchenko and the way he can set up his punches and uh, and the other way around as well for Dervianchenko how can really exploit Charles' deficiencies. Now, I remember one thing. I think one of the keys from for uh, Sergei Dervianchenko would be to use that double jab stepping in on the inside because the way um, Charlo... Charlo especially in the later rounds he can stand his ground and then uh, then uh, block the first punch from uh, from his opponent when his opponent is stepping in and then uh, get the leverage to counter to counter him on his second punch but most of the times when his opponents are stepping in with jab or with one twos what charlo is doing is he he parries a first jab while stepping back and when he's stepping back he moves his upper body away from that uh, lead from from his uh, lead hand so he stayed he he really stays open for uh, for a second jab and then once you get him out of balance when when you catch him with punches they don't have to be the good thing for Dervianchenko is that he's not loading up on his punches. He's more based on, his style is based on activity. And uh, he's going to be a very good thing for Dervianchenko because that's exactly what he needs against Charlo to defeat Charlo. He doesn't have to load up on his punches, at least in, uh, to defeat him, at least in the eyes of, of boxing fans of the years. Not, not saying anything about the scorecards. Yeah, uh, yeah, because you you throw you throw three, four, five punch combos against uh, Charlo. Uh, some of those punches get to him. You catch him with with some of them uh, on his face. He starts he starts lowering, cha changing his upper body level, lowering, trying to duck punches, the upcoming punches after that one that caught him, and he gets off balance. And great thing about Dervianchenko is that he can step back and even step back and keep you off balance with with multiple jabs. That's really good for him. <clears throat> but he. He also really needs to to pay attention to those right and left uppercuts, and even 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 the left hook. But what else is there to say about this fight? I'm I'm hundred percent positive. I'm missing a lot of things, and I do think that this fight is going to to be very interesting. I'm looking forward to it. But before giving you my my prediction, the way I see this fight going, just let me go quickly through comments again. Uh, Vader D saying, I have heard Broner is making a comeback at 140. I think Pedraza versus Broner would actually be good with Pedraza switch hitting almost his former like style now. Uh, yeah, first of all, I'm looking forward to, to see that that fight of his that I missed that happened, uh, that took place the last night. Uh, hold on. B Space saying older Charlo hasn't had any fights against fighter like Sergey. Yeah, yeah, that that's what I was saying. B, yeah, totally. So that that's a huge question. So what else uh, was B Space saying? I don't see him beating Sergey. Sergey with the angles can make Charlo look pretty bad. Charlo is a bit stiff. Yeah, I, I agree with it. Uh, his activity combined with angles, and plus on top of that, like you said, yeah, Charlo can be 
sometimes to vanilla, you know, to upright, to to Steve. He, both of them, Charlos, they have uh, extremely good fundamentals, and uh, I, I do think they're very good fighters. Uh, but yeah, he can be too a bit too upright. But I'll I'll come to 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 my prediction in a minute, in a second. Um, but I can totally, totally see it be space. Uh, just give me a second to, to finish with re reading all the comments and I'll get right to it. Uh, Duck, I don't think they will give Dervinchenko the decision, man. Charlo is headlining a, a pay-per-view now. Let, let, wait, wait to hear what I have to say about that. <laughs> Eldok saying Derianchenko might be shot. He took a lot of punishment over the course of his last three fights. Yeah, yeah, that's another big question mark about it. I mean, we may not, we don't know it for sure. Yeah, that's that's definitely a possibility. He may be shot, maybe not, but maybe he looks. He 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 turns turns out to be totally okay on the fight night the next week. At least I hope so. But because I'm looking forward to to seeing a good fight, you know. So it would be it would be a shame. But I don't I don't want to say that he's probably shot. Maybe it's the case. Maybe not. But I, I'm I just don't want to talk about my ASS. Uh, Duck is going with with a split decision for Jermal. Um, L Dog is going with uh, uh, Hold on, L Dog, you're talking about Jermal Charlo. Jermal is a one fifty four pounder, the one who's fighting. Oh yeah, no, okay, yeah, yeah. So that's it. So Charlo versus Rosario. He's picking Charlo. Mid round stoppage. Yeah, I can see something like that. I, I can even see Jermel, Jermel, ending him in in the first couple of rounds, three, four, five, six. I don't know exactly, but definitely, I'm expecting to see see a stoppage. And uh, then Aldo is also picking Jermel Charlo, late round stoppage versus Sergey Derianchenko. Duck, I can't pick Jermal by stoppage when he couldn't put Brandon Adams and Korobov away, lol. Yeah, I mean, but yeah, different different styles, different fights. But I, I would say the difference with Karabo, Korobov is that he was not really getting on the inside. He was, even when getting close to him, he was doing it. I mean, Sergey would definitely do it too, but you know, going to the blind angle. But the thing is, Korobov was boxing in and out, you know, countering uh, countering Char Charlos, Jermal Charlos' foot movement with his own stepping in at the right time, throwing his left hand and then getting out at an angle. Uh, while Dervianchenko, Dervianchenko, he will spend much more time in the pocket. Uh, he doesn't have the same type of footwork or, or the same type of style, you know. So that's why I can see. Although I'm seeing what you're saying, I can, I can, I still can see uh, Jermal Charlo stopping him. I'm not so sure about it, but yeah. Hold on. Uh, Duck is saying Brandon Adams was looking like Floyd Mayweather versus Jermal. <laughs> oh, I, I went through a lot of both of their fights, Sergey's and Charlo's fights. I sh I'm sure I saw the Adams fight. I, I just cannot remember how it went down. Real Jimmy Mack. Big up to you, Jimmy. Nice to see you. Thank you for being here. Official, my bro. How we doing? Mm, doing well, uh, man. You know what, Jimmy? Right now, right before going into my uh, Charlo Derianchenko prediction, I just have to take a big 
cup of water because I'm alone on the show tonight. Uh, corruption was not able to be here due to, uh, due to the illness. So I'm alone here. I need my water so bad. Uh, sorry, guys, just give me a really quick second. <clears throat> yeah, oh. we are back. Uh, damn, too bad I cannot. I have no time to to speak and read the chat and then manage the chat at the same time. I should give Duck, Shep, and uh, Jimmy Mac, probably. How do you say it? To, to, to let them manage the chat room, to give them the range, but I don't even know how to do it. You know, so so I'll have to do it after the show because I'm just ignoring um, people calling out each other and the other people I know in the chat room. I'm not interested in it. We are all about boxing here. Me and corruption in boxing. Duck saying, yeah, official, but he hit those guys clean enough off, and I'm not convinced that he has that kind of power. I mean, yeah, true, but I'm wondering if their movement was not taking away, taking his power away. l Dog saying, the Charlos are all fundamentals and athleticism don't have the elite level boxing skills. <clears throat> Sorry for that again. <laughs> yeah, Shep, right, exactly. Official thirsty like a Somalian, a Somalian in the desert. Right. Yeah, Doc, you and Shep, I think that both of you should definitely have a wrench, but I don't even know how to do it. But before ending the show, let me finally go to my prediction. So there are different, I mean, definitely this fight, I'm not taking uh, out of consideration any outcome, but yeah, Charles stopping the Ryanchenko, like Duck, Duck was saying, like uh, me and Duck were discussing. There are there are good uh, good reasons for for both for both sides for those thinking that Charlo can stop him or that he would not be able to stop him. Um, yeah, I'm probably I, I'm seeing this fight going full twelve, full twelve definitely. Um, more than I, I than I think. Uh, Charlo could stop him now to the decision there's a couple of scenarios I can see Dervianchenko outboxing him but the thing is I do not believe he in that case even in that case even if he he's able to outbox Jermal Charlo i don't think he will get the decision i think the chances for that are pretty much slim and i'll go into it in a second um, but it does not mean i don't believe um, charlo can can get a well deserved victory i can also see the scenario where in a in a tough close fight he can, you know, on my scorecards, win seven or eight rounds on my own scorecards and on your scorecards, guys. So, <clears throat> it's it's definitely a possibility. And, yeah, you know, I, I think his, his work rate is kind of... But being that... 
he can you know what he can he can land some big punches very visible very flashy punches under Vyanchenko, you know that 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 are going to catch the eyes of the judges but we know that anyways money is catching the eyes of the judges even more so than any activity in the ring that they're watching I do think that the fight fight will go this way. Sir, uh, Sergei Derevchenko will probably win more rounds in the ring against against Charlo, but the decision will go to Charlo. Uh, now, yeah, him Charlo winning the official decision and deserving really deserving a victory is uh, is possible as well the only thing is that uh, Sergei Dervianchenko has a much higher work rate and uh, he's very different to any of the previous Jermal Charles opponents but I can see the way you, you know Charlo can win, win rounds now why do I think uh, most of us think that if it goes full 12 that Jermal Charlo will get the decision without, without trying to, to hate on him because I do think he's, he's a very good fighter. And uh, I like a lot of, a lot of things that, that he's doing. And I'm, once again, I'm going to cover it in a film study. But see... There, there are many rumors, first of all, that the reason uh, BBC and Al Heyman are finally putting up some good cards, including this one that's, that's happening the next weekend, is because uh, they, they got an ultimatum from the networks. They have their boxer zone, meaning that they had enough of pathetic viewing numbers and uh, them matching up their biggest fighters against nobody is giving them the the showcase fights beaten up on bums so and, and I see it I see it uh, as a real possibility I, I think that this really may be the case not because not, certainly not because they want to give Charlo a tough fight. Because if history told us anything is that PBC and their top fighters are going to have keep on having the easiest fighters possible, the easiest fights possible uh, for as long as they're allowed to have to have those. So it's not like <laughs> they want to 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 put uh, Jermal Charlo in a tougher fight. It, it, it's because they they had to. They were given an ultimatum. Now, of course, <laughs> I was not a fly on the wall on the wall of Showtime or uh, Fox or whatever whatever is the network that is transmitting this pay-per-view. I think it's showtime. Yeah, I'm al almost positive, yeah. But I'm sure that's the reason I'll had to finally put him, uh, had to finally put Charlo in, uh, in such a good fight. And uh, compare Charlo, who's, uh, he's in his 30s, right? Maybe 30, 31, 32. Well, I think he's in very early 30s, like 30 years old, versus Dervianchenko, who's 35 years old, who's, uh, for many of us, Dervianchenko is a much more exciting fighter, but he doesn't have a name. He's not really promoted. Uh, he had a big fight against Triple G, but this is an occasion for, if everything goes well for Charlo, to... To get a victory over a guy who who gave a Triple G an extremely tough fight, you know, uh, Dervianchenko, who's uh, not very popular, 
not really promoted and um, it would be a good name on uh, on Charlotte's official resume why why would they give a fair decision to to Dervianchenko an Ukrainian you you see where I'm going so the reasons are pretty much clear. Charlo, he's a, he's an American. He's uh, he's the way just the way Al Heyman likes his fighters to be. And uh, basically, after after Wilder, first of all, after Floyd Mayweather retiring, and many of PBC's hopes, big hopes for PBC's future started losing their fights, including Wilder, whose resume was ter- terrible, and we were just waiting on a live body to expose him, to explode, to expose and explode, because <laughs> Tyson Fury exploded Wilder's head as well. <laughs> After Wilder being exposed, the only thing PBC got are um, Gervonta Davis, who's another guy that whose time is coming, and the Charles brothers. I mean, Gervonta Tank Davis is a re- very talented fighter, but I've been saying this for a long time. I saw him in his earlier pro days. He yeah, he was he was fighting a low level opposition, but he was trying so so many different things. I'm positive, one hundred percent positive. He he regressed. He he looks worse than ever, despite despite uh, all the experience he had. And let's not pretend uh, like he he had a huge experience. He was fighting bums. Even, even Gamboa, fifty years old Gamboa, forty years old, the Cuban age is the real fifties. Yeah, Shep, thank you. Yeah, so Charles, Charles, both of them are thirty years old. Yeah, versus Dervianchenko, thirty-five, and like uh, you and all, and other guys are saying, who's possibly on a decline, who's possibly shot, and doesn't have that reach among the public, the boxing public in, in the US. So there is no reason to promote uh, Dervianchenko and give him the victory. But with that go- with that being said, still, one more time, I'm not at all excluding a possibility of of Jermal Charlo winning a well-deserved victory neither. <clears throat> yeah, Tank, definitely he, he regressed. He's doing nothing but... He's him and and the two Charlo brothers are all that PBC got right now. And uh, yeah, I've I'm putting much more. I have bigger expectations at this point from from the Charlos than from uh, from Tank. To be honest with you, although I used to like Tank very much when when uh, I started following his earlier fights. There was there was a lot of different things that he was doing well. Nice footwork, in and out movement, countering, uh, boxing on the move. Not only you know, not only power punch, power punching and uh, explosive counters. <clears throat> Let me go through through the chat one more time. Oh, Duck, he wants to, to see Pedraza versus Drew want a rematch. Well, if a lot of you saying that he, he was looking so well in his fight the last night, then, yeah, why not? <laughs> I mean, I have to see that fight first. Sorry for a second.
Yeah. Uh, B-Space saying now Tanks promotes himself by saying he will make weight. Oh. <laughs> I'm not... Let's not pretend like anyone is believing Tank Davis and him saying that he's taking his career seriously. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> people have been saying for a long time that he's, uh, he's AB, Adrian Broner 2.0. <laughs> he, he, so by what you're saying, but what you're saying, B-Space, he also started... <laughs> giving the same pro the same promises AB is giving to us since since the Maidana fight but this uh, this time I'm really serious but this time I'm really serious trust me I'm taking my career seriously yeah <clears throat> real Jimmy Max uh, hold on triple JJJ looked like Doug Doug Biscuit in the last fight. Yeah, if we are talking about Tank Davis, he was looking really ter terrible against Gamboa. Real Jimmy Mac saying this is set up to be an alley-oop for Charlo. Well, yeah, good name on the record because there there is not a huge prob uh, possibility of Dervin trying to stop him. I'm not saying it's impossible. I can see it happening and I'll told you exactly how it can happen. It could happen, but most of us are not expecting that. Uh, Eldog saying Pedraza beats him now that Pedraza isn't a drained possibility, a good possibility. But one more time, I have to go and check that fight, see it for myself. Real Jimmy Mac also saying Gervont is one of those guys who feels like the work is already done and he needs to... Oh, sorry. My chat, my chat disappeared. I have to to restart my PC, so it will take it will take a minute or two. Man, if you guys listening to the to this podcast, just know how uh, how many technical troubles we are having. You would not believe it. Uh, Okay, I'm gonna read the chat on my phone. Yeah, I read uh, Eldoc saying Pedraza beats him now that that Pedraza isn't drained. Real Jimmy Mac was saying Gervont is one of those guys who feels li like uh, the work is already done and he need all he needs to do is to lose weight in camp and spar. Yeah, I mean it's not a surprise. He's not taking boxing seriously. Saint Breed Sports, Team Zoo versus Dennis Hogan in December. Triple JJJ saying only thing Tank Tank takes seriously is his bettering habit habits. Yeah, and to be honest, <laughs> I'm similar to him in that regard. <clears throat> L Dog is saying. Team Zoo and Madrimov are both KOing Lubin if they're ever facing. Duck saying like like Lubin wouldn't beat the ish out of Horn. Hold on, let me light up a cigarette. Yeah, but by the way, sorry, give me a second. But by the way, being that earlier during this show, I spoke about uh, Breedis versus Dorticus fight. I mean, you, you guys, you can go and check some of corruption's videos on his own channel named uh, corruption in boxing 
where um, b- because he he was covering a lot of those interesting fights that both of them Bridges and Dorticus had, and he was he was doing a great job of giving you his pre and post fight thoughts from the the previous tournament from the last year a year or two ago and for this year probably although i'm not so sure but yeah check it out and then i pretty much told you the same thing uh i was thinking about the outcome of the fight for a long time since since it's been announced for for the first time now if you go want to go into technicalities on my own channel i did a, i did a breakdown and prediction video for that fight um, nothing much changed except uh, for uh, for the the place where um, where the fight is happening it means it doesn't have uh, it doesn't it's not happening in Le- in a, sorry riga latvia but instead in munich germany uh, it may change uh, the way the judges score the fight or the way the referee behaves i'm not sure <laughs> but you know very well what Robert Bird was doing in semifinals of Bridis versus Glowatsky in Riga, Latvia. <clears throat> what else is there to be said? Yeah, so in the next episode. Corruption in boxing and myself are going to to cover those fights for sure. All of us know that that he 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 really likes Dorticus and I, I mean uh, the whole uh, this whole idea of of tournaments taking place in boxing. And it's definitely a great thing. And uh, he he's been one of those who who's been covering all the mini cool fights <clears throat> and uh, saying a lot of really smart things. There is no nonsense with nonsense with him. And so I cannot wait for uh, for all these fights to happen and then to cover him ju- just the day after. Always at the same time <clears throat> by the way duck in the chat room is asking me the fight is in germany yeah i did not know it uh you know what's funny duck the fight uh, between Bridis and orticus got announced uh, let's say it was like 20 something 22 or 24 days before uh before the date the date of the fight you know and out of nowhere, it was announced only 22, 24, 26 days in advance saying that it's taking place in Germany. Yeah, in Munich, Germany. So right now I'm still wondering if I'm going to go to to see that fight. But uh, I don't think so because I already spent a lot of money there. Uh, Doug saying, man, if there was a crowd allowed, I would have one went to British versus Dorticus. You know what? I, I think Duck, 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 hold on. <laughs> Duck, let's go and let's meet the fight because Duck, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, anyone in the chat room, please correct me if I'm wrong, but the fight is taking place in Germany because they want it to, to happen uh, with... Uh, with the crowd allowed so that's why i'm not even 100 percent sure about it but i do think that the crowd a crowd is going to be allowed <laughs> so i think that's uh, that's the very reason that they that they chose it 
that they placed the fight in the final to take place in Germany because they were saying there was a lower virus a lower virus risk for that fight to to take place in Germany uh, but yeah just just check out that and uh, let me know on discord or somewhere else you know on Twitter if uh, if the crowd is going to be allowed because if it is I may consider going uh, going there despite me already spending uh, a lot of money this month but I may I may consider go there going there if a crowd is allowed it would be really nice to see such a huge fight and a fight of the highest highest order in a very underrated yet great division that is cruiser uh, cruiserweight division but anyways i want to give huge shout out first of all to all of you being here with me first of all big up to to the co-host or the host because i call him the to me he's the brain behind this podcast but he's unable to be here tonight. Corruption in boxing. I hope you're doing well. Corruption, get well. And see you the next week. Big up to all of you in the chat room. Duck, Jimmy Mac, um, Triple JJJ, L Dog, Shep, B Space, um, Saint Brit Sports, Dead Guy. Uh, who else was there? Mm. Hold on, let me see. I remember Johnny Boy was there for a while, for a second. Big up to him. I told you, check out his channel if you don't already know him. Um, uh, Boxing Pinnacle TV. Sorry if I missed anyone else. Really sorry about it. About it. Um, but I would also like to give shout out to to corruptions long time long time friends from uh, Pound for Pound Boxing Report. It's a podcast on YouTube. A long time podcast, really, really good guys. They're constantly covering boxing know all the cards once a week just like us only the different days i think they are having their podcasts uh, on wednesdays uh very late for us in uh, in europe then of course our friend unravel boxing talking news strongly urge you to check out his channel but most of you probably all already know him and but not only not only that channel see the i was always saying this a six foot five guy with a guy uh, with a gun is a very dangerous guy but the only thing more dangerous than that is a six foot five guy with a doll and uh Unravel has <laughs> a potato doll named Spuddy. Spuddy lives with Unraveled, and uh, Spuddy he has uh, he has his own channel. He is the most knowledgeable boxing potato doll I ever knew. And Unraveled, if you don't mind, uh, can you give uh, the exact uh, name of Spuddy's channel? I think it's. Uh, Paddy, Spuddy on boxing or Spuddy boxing cables, something like that. If you don't mind uh, giving us the name in the chat room, who else is there? The everybody we knew for a long time from uh, BDA uh, boxing. Uh, man, uh, G Man, check out G Man, he's another Irish guy just like Mark. I only recently discovered his channel and uh, his constant 
with uh, not only with his views but also with his videos oh and uh, i don't want to forget our another big friend dell from blue color sports tv check out his channel one of the best channels british channels there's a lot of huge british channels on boxing here but Dell Dell is also doing a great job just just like the the other channels i mentioned so that's it thank you for being here and uh, really sorry if i missed someone any channels or any of you in the chat room you can catch us every time <laughs> i mean every week at the same time <laughs> every sunday so for europe for paris central europe it would be 9 p.m uh, in LA, it would be in the noon, in New York, uh, 3 p.m. Or if you're in Asia, Tokyo, 4 a.m., Australia, 5 a.m., um, the UK, 8, 8 p.m. So thank you for being with me, being with us uh, the next week. Uh, corruption in boxing is going to be here and trust me I cannot wait to to see what what is he going to say about uh, about the fights that are they that are taking place the next weekend just uh, just day before our podcast I know he cannot wait to see Breedis versus Dortico Snyder later triple JJJ Later, everyone else. Peace out. Thank you, guys, one more time.